Hey everyone, welcome back to the course. This week we're going to continue our space planning tutorial using subdivision and recursion. So last week we looked at an example uh, of how we can use a splitting logic to take a curve and split it into two curves and that forms the basis of our subdivision process. And first we developed that process purely in Grasshopper using Grasshopper components and then we actually took those same operations and translated them to Python code uh, using a Python component in Grasshopper. So what we're going to do this week is take that exact same logic and wrap it into a function in Python so that we can actually implement it in a recursive algorithm so that we can apply that splitting logic over and over again to the results of the splitting operation so we can actually take our starting boundary geometry that defines a floor plan and then apply the splitting logic recursively to create any number of smaller spaces. So before we get into the demo and actually see how we can implement this splitting logic recursively, uh, we need to take a look at two main uh, data types or representations of data in Python. So in the past few weeks, we've been working with Python a lot, and we already saw how we can use variables in Python to deal with data sets involving more than one item of data. And we looked at lists and we looked at dictionaries. What we're going to talk about today is not so much a new data type, but uh, two different ways in which we can use lists to store data uh, as we're going through different operations. So taking just a list in Python, we can actually work with it in two different ways. Uh, one which is known as a queue, and this comes from the idea of a queue being like a line, uh, you know, in which people stand, uh, or a stack. And the main difference is how we work with data um, in terms of how we put items into that data set and how we take items out. So when we have a kind of process like recursion, which works with data sets uh, one item at a time, we can think of those data sets as first a queue, um, where whenever we create a new piece of data, we add it to the end of the list. And whenever we need to take an item out of that uh, data, we take it from the front of the list, right? So this is known as a last in first out. And this is sort of how a queue of people works when people are standing in line, right? When you're waiting for something, you join the line at the back, and then the line is processed starting from the beginning of the line. So we call this last in first out. Alternatively, we can think of another type of uh, list where we add items to the front of the list, and we also take items from the front of the list. So we call this first in first out. So as we add items, we push them to the stack, we, we push them uh, to the beginning of the stack, and then we pop items from the top of the stack uh, as well. So you can see here, if we number the items sequentially based on how they've entered the list, in a queue, we start with the first items, in the stack, we actually start with the last items. So both queues and stacks are really uh, useful kind of ways of working with lists of data and you'll see them both be used in different kinds of algorithms. So here's how they're implemented in Python. Again, uh, both of them are based on a list structure, so you can start with creating an empty list. And if you're working with a queue, you'll often uh, use the append uh, method of a list to actually add new items to the end of that list as you create them. And then when you want a new item from the list, you'll use the pop uh, method of the list to actually take an item from the beginning of the list using the zero index, right? So zero means the first item of the list and pop accepts an index to tell you which item it's taking out. So this is a queue structure. You add an item to the, to the end of the list, you take items from the front of a list. A stack on the other hand works uh, in a lot, of, uh, pretty much the same way where you use the append method to add an item to the end of the list but now we're actually gonna take items from the end of the list as well by using the negative one index uh, in our pop method. So the way that this idea of queues and stacks applies to recursion is um, it depends on where we kind of apply that recursive function, right? Remember, recursive functions work by basically applying the same function within the function call itself. And so when, when we're working with recursive functions and we're generating data, the question is, where do we actually apply that recursive function? And the basic implementation of recursion that we've already seen 
in this class is uh, what can be called a stack based recursive process where as you're creating new data through the recursive function you're actually then applying that recursion again directly to that new data that you just created so if we look at a simple example here then we'll do this in python uh, we'll get to the demo in a minute um, we can start the recursive process by calling the split recursively function on a starting curve right so this will be our boundary curve we start with that curve and we call this function now when we call this function we're going to run the split curve uh, function within it to take that curve and create two new curves right so we call this uh, split function within our recursive function it's going to take in our starting curve create two new curves and then to do the recursive uh, recursive part of the process we'll actually return a list that's going to give us the results of this recurse split recursively function applied again directly to the results uh, of our first split right so if we start with a curve we'll create two new curves and each of these will then be run through this function and that will repeat over and over and over again and what you'll find is as the recursive happens it's kind of works like a stack where you're running that recursive process uh, as a priority on the newest curves you formed and what you'll find is you know if you have some kind of stop stopping logic where you only run the recursion a certain number of times as we will in our demo you'll have this uh, issue where um, you're only going to kind of drill deeper and deeper into one curve. So if every time you run recursion, you form two curves and you prioritize the new curves, you're going to keep splitting that same curve over and over and over again. So as an alternative, we have a different kind of uh, approach to recursion, which we can call queue-based recursion, where we still run the process recursively by calling the function within itself. But now instead of calling that uh, function again on the latest object form we're gonna keep a list of objects and each time we run the recursion we're actually gonna take the first item out of that list run the splitting operation on that item but then we're not gonna directly call recursion on the new curves formed we're actually gonna take those new curves we're gonna add them at the end of our list and run recursion again on that whole list and so you form a kind of queue where you run the recursive process, but uh, the things, the new elements you form, you actually add to the end of the list, so they're considered last, and you prioritize the oldest elements in that list. Uh, so to implement that kind of structure, we change our function a little bit. So again, we call our split recursively function the first time, but now you see our starting curve, we actually pass it as a list. So instead of passing just a single curve to the function, we pass a list with one element in it. So now our split recursively function takes a list of curves. In the beginning, there's just one. Here's the pop method of the list. So we take the first item out of that list, and that's going to be our starting curve. Now, again, we apply the split curve function to take that curve and create two new curves. But before we run the recursively function again, we'll actually take those new curves and add it to the end of our curves list. So if you follow this process the first time, when there's one item in the curves list, we'll take that item out. So curves is actually an empty list. We're gonna take that list and add our new items to that, um, to, to the end of that list. And then we're gonna run the split recursively function again on the entire list, right? So the second time it's run, there's gonna be two curves. We're gonna take the first one out. We're gonna split it but the results we're going to add to the end of the list so that when we run the split recursively function a third time, we're actually going to consider not the two new curves, but the second one of the first set of curves that we created. So this will make a more even division where we're kind of going to start from the beginning, split the curve once, split both of the results, and then go on to the children of both of those operations. And that's going to form a more uh, kind of even splitting process. And this kind of queue-based recursion forms a kind of template for any kind of recursive function we want to create, right? So in here, um, we can put any kind of function. In our case, we have a split curve function that takes one curve and creates two curves out of it. But you can replace this with any kind of function as long as that function takes one object as an input 
and creates one or more objects of the same type, you can actually use this kind of uh, function as a template for any kind of recursive function you want to create, whether it's uh, has to do with splitting and subdivision or growth or branching or uh, anything like that. So based on this recursive uh, process, we're going to take our splitting logic, we're going to wrap it into a function, and then we're going to implement that function recursively using our uh, Q-based recursive template. Now once that's done, we're going to be able to run this recursive subdivision process any number of times based on the set of parameters to create uh, any number of resulting spaces. So in this case, we've run recursion nine times to create 10 spaces. And the question then is going to be, um, how do we evaluate these subdivision results so that we can actually optimize better layouts? So we're going to ask basically, how can we create a number of objectives that we can give to discover so that when we run the optimization, it gives us the kind of layouts we want. Because remember, all we've done is implemented this kind of logic for subdivision uh, based on a set of parameters, but the computer won't know yet how it has to actually evaluate those different solutions to give us the spaces we want. And as always with optimization, we not only have to set up the model and the logic of how to produce different um, examples of, of the designs, but also a set of objectives or constraints to tell the computer what kind of designs we're actually after. And so what we're going to do in the demo is actually create three different types of objectives that analyze or uh, quantify our layouts in different ways, right? So before we get into anything around what these rooms are, we can have some kind of high level objectives for our layouts. For example, the first one can be, um, trying to get the different spaces that come out of our optimization to be roughly the same size, right? So maybe we want to lay out a set of rooms in our space. And just as a starting point, we think it's going to be easier to plan these spaces if they're all the same size. So the way we're going to implement this is we're actually going to take the list of areas of all the spaces produced, and we're going to take the largest area, the space with the largest area, and divide that area by this, the area of the smallest space, the one with the smallest area, and that's going to give us a number. And to optimize our layout so that the spaces are as even as possible, we want to minimize that resulting value, right? So as the spaces get closer in area, we know that the largest area and the smallest area are going to be closer and closer to each other, and if we divide the largest by the smallest, that number is going to get smaller and smaller as well. You know, if all the spaces are exactly the same size, the largest and the smallest will be equal, and that's going to give us a one. As they get further apart, the largest area is going to get bigger, so that number is going to increase as well. So we're going to set this up as a minimization objective, and we know that the better this number gets, the closer it's going to be to one. The second type of objective we're going to look at, uh, we'll call squareness. So we're going to try to get the area um, or the shapes of the resulting uh, curves as close to square as possible. So we're going to try to equalize their aspect ratios, right? Because we don't want long, skinny spaces. Um, uh, we're going to try to get those spaces to be like as close to squares as possible. Um, and because you know we're subdividing based on any kind of boundary. Uh, shape, we can't necessarily like treat these like rectangles, but we can take the bounding box of each of these shapes and look at the length and width of each of their bounding boxes and try to normalize those as well. So we're going to use a very similar logic where we're going to take the longer edge of the bounding box and divide it by a smaller edge of the bounding box, knowing that as those get more equal and the bounding box gets more square, that that number is going to get closer to one. So we're going to sum all those numbers together and try to get that uh, entire sum of uh, measurements as close to one as possible by minimizing it. And the last kind of consideration we'll look at is, you know, once we uh, get the areas to, of the uh, shapes to be as equal as possible and we get their, uh, the length and, and, and widths of the bonding box as equal as possible, we have one more objective where we're going to try to make 
the shapes actually as close to an area as their bounding boxes as possible. You know, because we have this situation where we might create these kind of complex shapes where even if the area is close to the area of another shape, uh, and even if the bounding box itself is very square, the shape might be very irregular. We want to minimize that by actually trying to get the area of the bonding box, which is always either equal or greater than the area of the shape itself and the shape's area as close to each other as possible. Again, by dividing one the smaller by the bigger and then minimizing that so that approach is one. So those are going to be our three objectives. And finally, we're going to look at um, how we can run those objectives separately as a multi-objective optimization problem in Discover, but also how we can actually combine those different objectives together and run a single optimization problem uh, in Discover. And you see, because we've been very strategic in setting up each of our objectives as a minimization problem that trends towards one, in order to combine all those objectives into one single objective, we can actually just take the results of each of those objectives and multiply them together and minimize the entire product, right? Because we know that if the numbers are large, if each one of these gets big, then the product gets big, right? And that, that's a bad thing. And that's going to be minimized during the optimization. As each of them get closer to one, you know, ideally, if we get the best result being one, that's going to basically cancel itself out of the multiplication. Right? So in this way, we can use the product to basically uh, weigh all of the different objectives against each other to create a single objective. And we're going to run these optimizations and discover, and we're going to show basically the advantages and disadvantages of taking these exact same three objectives and running them separately as different objectives or running the optimization with a single objective with all of them combined. And basically the trade-off is, you know, if we run these options, objectives separately, you're going to be able to look at each one individually because they're going to be handled separately in the optimization, right? So in the scatter plot, we're going to be able to see designs that optimize one of these objectives over the other. The disadvantage is that when you have multiple objectives, you know, at the end, that number of objectives grows, um, the optimizer doesn't have a single target to shoot for, right? It's going to explore a lot of these variations. And in the end, it's going to give us some designs that, you know, prefer some objectives over others without considering all of them in totality. So there, a lot of times there's an advantage to combining all of your objectives into a single objective because then you have one goal and you have one trajectory and you can actually track over time, like how your designs are improving in total because there's only going to be one best design and uh, you can do you can do that kind of combination to a single objective if you're very careful about how you frame uh, the different objectives or the different aspects of what you're after uh, but in the end there's no rule of thumb here sometimes you want to run your problems uh, with multiple objectives separately if you know especially if they don't have much to do with each other but in this case you know, if we have these different considerations, but we're really after just one criteria of having like the most rational laid out spaces, uh, oftentimes it's better to actually combine those into a single objective.